Now, I believe all of us are familiar with the original ecclesiastical mission of monastics who were sent to America by Empress Catherine the Great, and how those missionaries stood up against the terrible abuses of the Russian-American company. We know that the Russian missionaries fully embraced an Alaskan native mindset and the peoples as well. By adopting the people as their children and by being adopted by them as their fathers, the missionaries were able to teach and live in orthodoxy that became distinctly Russo-native in tradition and practice. Orthodoxy was never experienced as a faith forced upon them from the outside, but rather as the perfect expression of who, as a people, they have always been. St. Herman, of course, was the ideal example of how to cultivate orthodoxy by leading a prayerful life of complete devotion to God, by loving the faithful wholeheartedly, and by demonstrating that love practically by the establishment of orphanages and schools. And the result, the diary of one missionary reads, the Lord be praised. We have baptized more than 7,000 Americans, and we have performed more than 2,000 marriage ceremonies. In short, we love them, and they love us. Looking back at this Russian period, it was a golden age of Orthodox missionary labors, and I would say on par with the labors of, of the Apostle Paul at the time of the spreading of the gospel. The generosity from those in the Church of Russia, from prominent figures such as Catherine the Great, St. John Kronstadt, and many, many others, they provided stipends for the clergy. They covered the cost of ecclesiastical items and the church books required for the services, as well as the publication of books in the native's own languages. Through the continued gener generous support of the Imperial Russian Orthodox Mission Society, the Russian Orthodox Church in Alaska built cathedrals with three altars, with an abundance of beautiful churches, with bilingual schools associated with each church, with orphanages and other means to provide for the poor in tangible ways. Through the labors of St. Innocent and the venerable missionaries thereafter, the, native, the natives' oral languages became written ones, each with its own distinctive, adaptive Cyrillic alphabet. The native, natives were given not only the linguistic tools to understand texts in Church Slavonic and Russian, but also the means to translate those texts together with the missionaries into their own local languages. In 1828, Saint Innocent himself translated the Gospel of Matthew and frequently used prayers into Anangan. Again, the generosity of the Russian church supported both these translations and their publications. By the mid-19th century, Alaskan natives had become educated polyglots conversant in at least one native language, as well as Church Slavonic and Russian. Some of our clergy even today recall as children singing the liturgy from text in Yupik written in that adapted Cyrillic script. All of us know something about this period. We rejoice in it, we claim it as our own, the first triumph of orthodoxy in this land. Understanding the period that followed these years, however, is essential to understand your brothers and sisters up north as they appear today. And it's essential that we look at the history from the perspective of the natives themselves, which is quite different from the perspective of the dominant culture in the United States. After many conversations with native clergy and faithful, I can see that they understand their history as one being marked by three tragedies. First, the tragedy of the regime change in Alaska, second, the tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution, and third, the tragedy of 21st century failures. There are other tragedies that I could relate, but I'll limit myself to these three. The th first tragedy is what Russians call the sale of Alaska, what Americans call the purchase of Alaska, but what the natives themselves experienced as a regime change that brought a very different approach to their culture to their language, and to their personhood. After the Russian flag was load, lowered in Novo Arkhangelsk, today known as Sitka, the respect and privileges as citizens that were accorded to the natives by the Russian government were not continued by post-Civil War America, whose main approach to Native Americans was that of warfare and restriction to Indian reservations, 
that Americans' indigenous populations interpret as nothing less than genocide. To avoid the Indian Wars in the lower 48, the United States federal government adopted a plan for coercive westernization and acculturation of the Russo-Native population. Almost every Native Orthodox Christian in the state is familiar with the Presbyterian minister Sheldon Jackson's promise to eradicate every trace of Russian Orthodoxy and from Alaska's, Alaskan soil within 25 years. The Natives were Christians, but they were the wrong kind of Christians. They were Orthodox Christians. From the Natives' perspective, what followed was a cultural genocide of the worst form, as it was taking place in their motherland, which meant if their culture was lost here, it would be ultimately lost everywhere, meaning total extinction. From Sheldon Jackson's perspective, his was an enlightened choice. Quote, we have no higher calling in the world than to be missionaries of our ideas to those people who have not yet reached the Anglo-Saxon frame of mind. What a stark contrast with our Russian missionaries who brought Christianity and led the natives to conclude, as one Aleut put it, we Aleut people, we were always Orthodox. We just had to wait for Christ to come and show that to us. And so the Presbyterian minister, Sheldon Jackson, approached President Grant with a proposal for an American Christian takeover of Alaskan territory. Tragically, for the Alaskan native, that proposal was approved. And so with federal sanctions and with Protestant missionary zeal, Alaska was carved up into what was known as spheres of influence, and heterodox missionaries began to pursue a hostile, a hostile campaign to convert the native Orthodox peoples of Alaska to prominent American, American heterodox confessions. Again, almost anything was acceptable as long as it was not the Orthodox Church. Government supported mandatory Protestant mission boarding schools for native children were purposely set up on our Russian Orthodox strongholds at Sitka, Kodiak, and at Alaska. That's the locations where my three cathedrals uh, were located. Large churches with three altars. With Presbyterians praying on the Orthodox Klingets, Baptists on the Orthodox Aleutics of Kodiak Island, Roman Catholics on the Yupiks of the Yukon, and Moravians praying on the Orthodox Yupiks in the Kaskokwim and so on and so forth. This conversion took place by duplicity, bribery, and outright violence. The Jesuits, who had martyred St. Peter of the Aleut in 1815, joined the charge in the Yukon in the 1890s, claiming to villagers, the Russians have left you under our protection. You are now, uh, now ours. Other <sighs> confessions were even harsher. The Baptists would rip the crosses off young Aleut, Aleut children's necks and would ask them to bring their parents' icons to be burned for a few pieces of candy. Native Orthodox Christian children were also torn away from their families and culture for the purpose of Christianization. Some bravely held on to their faith, imitating our first native Peter the Aleut, but others were not strong enough. With tears, our Orthodox Native mothers and fathers were forced to sign papers, turning over their children to mandatory Protestant boarding schools in Alaska and the Lower 48 for five years of indoctrination. In these schools, Native practices, language, culture, and Russian Orthodoxy were ridiculed, suppressed, and forcibly replaced by European uh, culture and Protestant worldview. I have some of my priests, I've, I've given this talk to in, my, in the presence of some of my priests, and some of them have actually uh, started to weep because they themselves, they themselves, especially the older ones, were sent to such schools. And they remember their parents not wanting to send them to such schools. And they remembered having to do whatever they could to fit in and to not stand out as being, uh, as being Russian Orthodox. Natives rightly proud of their fluency in multiple languages, were shamed for speaking Russian and their native tongues, often having to endure beatings and public humiliation. 
Protestant teachers would even du duct tape the mouths of small native school children for daring to utter, utter a word in Russian or in their native tongue. And they, a lot of them sp still spoke Russian because there was, of course, these bilingual schools also next to every single parish. Um, the last one was actually closed by the federal government in 1907, was in uh, St. Paul's Island. Jackson argued that this approach to the natives and to their language was reasonable since native languages were, in his words, stunted, barbaric, and only worthy of destruction since they were useless for communicating with whites, inadequate for widening intellectual horizons, and the chief way that these natives remain bound to their primitive culture with all their degrading customs. These are the very languages of the cultures and the peoples that our Saint Innocent and our missionaries had honored, giving their languages written form and even encouraging the development of native literary works. Sheldon Jackson's plan was, from his perspective, a great success. In less than two generations, our unified native populations were religiously fragmented, culturally subverted, and an almost entirely orthodox native population had been decimated, most exemplified in Southeast Alaska, which was where Sheldon Jackson put his headquarters. 90% of the Russian Orthodox Klingons became Presbyterians. 60% of the Yupik population became Arabians. Roman Catholics and Baptists. 95% of the Athabascans became Protestants, and 50% of the Aleutics became Baptists. Until the 1920s, the natives were not considered real Americans and were even accused of being Russian nationals. And so, natives who were full citizens in imperial Russia were now deprived of the right to vote. Cultural genocide was complete for those who left the church but even for those who remained, they were not left without scars. Skills in their langu native language were lost if they did not lose the ability to speak completely. With the sale of Alaska came the loss of their culture, the loss of their language, the loss of their dignity, and for many, the loss of their holy Orthodox faith. The deep pain and trauma of this experience in all native communities was followed on a sociological level with an epidemic of antisocial and self-destructive behavior in which medicating with alcohol and drugs continues to play an enormous role. For the Alaska Native, the sale of Alaska was an indisputable tragedy, a tragedy for the people, a tragedy for the church, and a tragedy of church leadership as the Russian Orthodox Church basically abandoned the flock in Alaska at the very time when reinforcement was needed most. The second tragedy to affect the good Orthodox peoples in the North is the tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution. Of course, that affected our entire church in North America, but the difference in wealth and industry between Alaska and the lower 48 meant that the repercussions in Alaska were much more severe. That revolution, that which cut off the church in America from the Russian Orthodox Church, not only left the church in Alaska without visionary leadership, but also in a severe financial predicament. Banks began to foreclose on orphanages no longer able to run without the financial support of the Imperial Russian Orthodox Mission Society. The seminary in Sitka was closed. Valuable church properties were seized. The publication of text, Orthodox texts in native languages stopped. The number of priests dwindled. The missionary period was decisively over. This, in turn, left the native populations defenseless in the face of aggressive tactics of Orthodox missionaries who would and still do entice native children for a week of fun, fellowship, and instruction on the evils of our treasured icons and why it is wrong to make the sign of the precious cross. What followed were first years of neglect until there was renewed interest surfaced with the autocephaly granted to our Orthodox Church in America. It was a time of great excitement with a newly established seminary and great achievements such as an increasing number of native priests. 
The third tragedy to affect the Alaskan church was a period of unfortunately pastoral, pastorally insensitive and oppressive church leadership in the 2000s that ended up traumatizing many of the clergy and nearly all of the parishes in the diocese. Native clergy and faithful lived in fear of harsh church leadership to the point of trembling and tears from experiences of again being publicly berated and humiliated in their own divine services. At the close of this period, many of the disillusioned natives turned away from the church altogether. As one Ubik elder put it, our minds are broken, our hope is torn down. To see our priests cry, I cry with them, the light has gone out. Unfortunately, some of this damage is irreparable as many of the faithful during that time have either reposed, apostatized, or simply want nothing more to do with the church that brought them pain.